Let me welcome you to my lecture on architecture, programming models for GPUs and for core processors. And before we go into the actual content and into all the details, let me give you a brief motivation and an overview, and then we'll also take the opportunity to discuss some administrative issues before we get into the actual content of the lecture. So as a motivation, um, Nowadays, arguably, the most important coprocessor architecture is the graphics processing unit, the GPU. So the purpose of the graphics processing unit is that of generating raster images. So a raster image uh, is a 2D array that is comprised of what we call pixels. Those are tuples, usually color tuples, comprised of R, G, B, red, green, and blue color components. And the input to the graphics pipeline that is executed by the GPU is a either textual or machine readable description of a 3D scene. And on a very low level, that 3D description of the scene is comprised of graphics primitives, of usually of triangles. And each triangle is again comprised of three vertices. And uh, those are entered into the graphics pipeline for further processing. So after we entered the vertices into the graphics pipeline, um, what ensues is a massively parallel processing stage that will apply certain uniform operations on each and every vertex. So those operations may, for example, be lighting operations or 3D transformations like rotations, like translation or uniform scales, whatever, and um, they are executed uh, uniformly and uh, like in a bulk process processing fashion on each vertex. And um, after each vertex was processed on what we call the vertex stage of the graphics pipeline, they are turned into something that is called a fragment. And what is a fragment? Um, essentially, a fragment is a pixel, but it is not a pixel yet. That is, we don't know if the, uh, the fragment will actually manifest as a pixel or if it will later be occluded by other fragments or if the color contribution from the fragment will be mixed with other fragments. So it's, it's, like, it's like a pre-stage of a pixel, but an important characteristic is that uh, at, this, at this stage where the fragments are processed, we also have a bunch of them, like, like many fragments, and they are all processed in parallel, and then they are finally turned into pixels, and those pixels are written into the 2D raster, um, and finally uh, make up the raster image. So what we have here is a pipeline architecture where we have a bunch of vertices that are streamed into the graphics processing units that are acted upon by certain processors, by vertex processors, and um, those execute the vertex stage, the operations that are applied per vertex. And then after those uh, operations were executed, they retire the vertices and uh, turn them into fragments and pass their output over to the fragment unit and the fragment unit uh, will process the fragments that are resulting from the vertex stage and uh, at the same time while the fragment uh, processors are operating the uh, vertex processors uh, can, uh, can again in parallel process the next vertices so we are basically streaming all the vertices through the graphics pipeline turn them into fragments and while fragments are processed, we can operate on the on, on, on the next batch of vertices. So in such a pipeline uh, architecture, what is um, important is that we have uh, roughly the same amount of work on all stages. And otherwise, pipeline stages will starve, what will eventually result in load imbalances. So say, for instance, you have many more vertices than you have fragments, then uh, you have uh, lots of heavy load on the vertex stage and the processors on the vertex stage are working and operating all the time and the fragment processors don't have anything to do. And um, this type of design is uh, what, 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 what vendors actually incorporated into GPUs. 
was a design where you had uh, dedicated processors for uh, first for the vertex stage and then for the fragment, pro fragment stage. And each of those processors was able to perform a certain type of uh, operations like um, floating point operations on the vertex stage to perform lighting calculations or to perform uh, transformations and maybe inter integer style operations on the fragment stage because those are, were more important in order to process, process fragments. And um, each of the processor type was uh, able to perform certain type of tasks but couldn't do tasks from the other stages. So, and the solution that the vendors came up with in the early 2010s uh, was that of what, what was called a unified shader architecture. So, <clears throat> GPUs up until then were comprised of um, many, many fragment processors, many, many vertex processors. And um, the vendors made, this, made these uh, processors a bit more general in that um, the processors from one stage could also perform operations from the other stages. And by that, they were able to devote, um, de devote processors uh, from the vertex stage to the fragment stage uh, if there was more heavy load on the fragment stage. That, of course, means uh, that, you, that the uh, processors are more general. And that, of course, also means more, yeah, more friction because um, you now have like uh, general instruction sets and processors that, um, that, that, that incorporate circuitry and that implement operations that, uh, that, are, that aren't necessarily so important for the very stage they are currently operating on. But, uh, but uh, on the other hand, you now have an architecture that is uh, very general and where you can uh, hide and where you can get rid of all those load imbalances. So, and as a consequence of this, GPUs um, gradually involve, uh, evolved to, um, to, to more general architectures in a sense that, you, that we now had a, had a type of ship that incorporated lots of tiny, lightweight cores that uh, each in and of itself acted a little bit like a CPU, like it was able to perform IEEE 754 floating point operations and um, it was uh, able to do like basic math operations like trigonometry or, uh, or square root and it just so happens that all of those are operations that are also important um, not only for graphics processing but for other types of processing like um, floating point operations, for example, uh, can also be used to perform like uh, physical simulations or meteorological simulations. And it also just so happens that this uh, characteristic of GPUs that you have many very lightweight processors um, that uh, each of each of them isn't 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 very capable. Where each of them isn't very capable, um, but you have uh, lots of them and uh, they all can operate in parallel. And it just so happens that uh, this is also a characteristic that lends itself to certain types of computations. For example, to computations from physics, to, uh, to computations that are important for meteorology, or for weather forecast, forecasting. So um, what this resulted in um, was that uh, people um, were actually quite inventive. Like uh, they took this processor, this type of processor, and they had their specific problems, and then they transformed their problems into graphics problems, solved them on the GPU, and then retrieved output that was graphics specific, like uh, raster images, and then rep then interpreted them as domain specific output. Take for example. Um, vectorial input or vectorial data like uh, you have a velocity vector which is an x y z tuple and you might as well interpret that x y z tuple as an rgb color and process the colors those 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 inter interpret those uh those uh those velocities as colors store them in texture images 
and um, upload those texture images to the GPU, program, uh, process them as part of the GPU graphics pipeline. Um, the graphics pipeline, again, uh, outputs um, RGB, and then you, uh, you, 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 you download that RGB to the CPU, that RGB image, that raster image to the GPU, and uh, on, the GP, on the CPU, you download it to the CPU, and then on the CPU, you again interpret it as uh, vectorial data. Like you can also output like gray images and uh, interpret the gray value as a scalar. And um, what this eventually led to was um, people performing physics simulation and uh, other types of simulation on the GPU. And that, that again led to, yeah, obviously the vendors recognizing that people do this, like um, NVIDIA or ATI, they recognized that people were using their processors not only for graphics processing, but also for, uh, for high performance computing. So, and then in turn, the vendors developed uh, specific APIs that were, um, were devoted to what is uh, nowadays called general purpose GPU computing or GPU programming and in short, GPGPU. And uh, this development which ultimately led to GPGPU and also to uh, certain, uh, to, to certain uh, very uh, specific types of processors and uh, that, uh, that, 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 that turn GPUs into what they currently are. This will be the very topic of this lecture. So, and then there's also an orthogonal development uh, from vendors that are typically more into CPUs instead of GPUs. And um, that development uh, led to uh, to a term that was coined um, that was uh, that of the Manicore processor, and the first Manicore uh, processor project was Intel's Larrabee. Larrabee actually uh, never made it into an actual product, um, but was superseded by the Intel Xeon Phi coprocessor family. And the Intel Xeon Phi's uh, were introduced at around 2013-2014. And um, they were uh, single-chip processors um, that were equipped with 64 or more cores. And each of those cores was advertised as being an individual Pentium processor. Like uh, Those processors had certain types of characteristics like wide Zimby lanes. Um, we, will, we will discuss later on in the lecture what that means. Uh, it basically means that there is uh, that there's even more parallelism than those uh, 64 processor cores that, uh, that uh, in and of itself can uh, operate in parallel. So those were highly um, parallel, massively parallel processors um, with similar characteristics to GPUs. But uh, then they were also a bit different. And um, so, uh, in fact, this development was actually uh, later, like this was actually abandoned by Intel, who were a major driver of the uh, many core uh, developments. But, um, but many of the things that were, that were uh, developed during that time um, made or, later made it into uh, the Xeon server processors. And because of that, um, We'll we'll also uh, uh, we'll also talk about uh, this specific coprocessor architecture, and then there's an let's say coprocessor type um, that doesn't even need an instruction set architecture, but where you can program uh, the hardware directly on the circuitry level, um, and uh, this architecture is called uh, field programmable gate arrays, and they also uh, nowadays. Um, can be used as coprocessors, and in that they are, and that there are development boards or, um, or also production boards um, that are used as plugin cards that are connected to the PC uh, via PCI Express, and that are also can perform certain uh, dedicated operations. And um, if there is time during the lecture, we will also talk about FPGAs. Let us now have a look. Uh, into the preliminary outline of this lecture. This lecture is mostly a high performance computing lecture. So in the first uh, few sessions, like in the first three or four sessions, we will talk a lot about the performance of computer programs and how to assess the performance 
and what the performance of a computer program is when run on specific architectures, like for example, massively parallel architectures. We will then also discuss a bunch of parallel algorithms. Like this is not a rigorous parallel algorithms class, so we'll only scratch the surface here and discuss certain algorithms that are uh, later of importance uh, to, to other topics of the lecture. And um, as I already said, uh, the lecture is highly influenced by GP GPU and by, uh, by graphics cards and uh, by the developments that uh, led to what is nowadays called GP GPU. And in order to understand what's going on there, um, uh, students need a certain understanding of computer graphics. And um, as a pre prerequisite, it is uh, very helpful to uh, already have attended a computer graphics class. Um, but the topics that are of importance uh, to this lecture uh, will be conveyed uh, during, during those sessions on computer graphics. Like, it is helpful if you already have attended like Professor Lang's class on computer graphics, um, but it's not a necessity in order to uh, follow the lecture because uh, those topics from computer graphics that are important to the lecture, to the understanding of the lecture, uh, will be discussed during the computer graphics uh, sessions of this lecture. And um, we will also, we will on the one hand uh, discuss computer graphics, but again, um, this will not be a rigorous computer graphics class and uh, that we thoroughly um, understand or all the algorithms from computer graphics, but we will mostly concentrate on those algorithms that are relevant to the GPU graphics pipeline. Equipped with all that knowledge about um, graphics, about parallel algorithms, about performance of computer graphic of computer programs, and about the graphics pipeline, we will uh, then move on to uh, understand what GP GPU programming is. And we will also have a look at practical examples. And we will do this uh, based on the NVIDIA CUDA programming language that we will also learn uh, throughout the course of the lecture. So the lecture and the accompanying exercises will also have an application-centric part where we will put what we have learned to good use and where we will look into certain applications like, for example, physics simulation on GPUs. Then there are certain other topics that we uh, might touch upon if there is time, like the aforementioned FPGA, like multi-GPU systems where you have like a couple of GPUs uh, in one host system. And we will, um, if there is time, also have a look uh, into something uh, that is called ray tracing hardware. And um, ray tracing is an alternative algorithm um, for generating computer graphics imagery. Like uh, this is another type of algorithm that can produce raster images. And uh, the focus of this type of algorithm is high realism. Like what actually happens in a ray tracer is that you simulate uh, light transport throughout a three-dimensional scene. So basically the process of generating an image becomes a simulation. And uh, for a very long time, this type of algorithm in order to generate a real-time images was deemed just too compute intensive. And this has changed over the last uh, two to three years roundabout, where NVIDIA in 2018 um, equipped their GPUs with a couple of uh, dedicated cores uh, that can perform uh, ray tracing in hardware. And if there's time during the lecture, we will also discuss this type of uh, newly added hardware. So as this is primarily a high-performance computing lecture, we will also touch upon certain uh, HPC topics, like, for example, distributed memory systems, where you have a couple of computers that are connected via network and that uh, solve certain computational problems together and in, in conjunction. And in order to do so, they pass each other messages and we will have a look at uh, how this is programmed uh, using, using certain APIs. Let us now switch over to some administrative issues. Let's first talk about dates. We will have a lecture uh, on Thursdays and on Fridays, and the lectures will be at 12 p.m. 
And we will have exercises on uh, Thursday um, at 2 p.m. after the Thursday lecture. Uh, the lectures will be pre-recorded and will be made available at 12 p.m. at each of those days. The exercises will be live and over Zoom and uh, the uh, specifics, specifics of that will be announced later via, via Elias and uh, via the website. And um, our first live exercise will be on April 29th. On holidays, there will be no sessions, or neither live, neither live nor recorded. Um, then there's also I'm also having plans to uh, to, uh, to 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 do a mock exam towards the end of the semester. So when I first gave that lecture in 2018, and then later in 2019, uh, uh, both times uh, we had mock exams and. Um, so I'm not sure what this format will look like uh, this semester. Like it will probably be an online format, um, which depends on the development uh, with regard to the pandemic. And um, uh, what that lo will look like uh, will be announced. And um, nevertheless, the mock exam will presumably be during the week of July 22nd. The dates of our exams will be um, July 29th. Um, from 11.45 to uh, 3.15. And the second exam will be on September 17th from 9.45 to uh, 1.15 p.m. So the uh, lectures will be pre-recorded and they will be published on Elias uh, under the link that you can find here. And you can also uh, find the Elias course um, directly through the website. And um, then there is a website where we'll also pu uh, publish course material and links to the videos, which is under vis.uni-kern.de. And um, on Elias, there is no password protection, so you can just join the course there, and uh, from there we'll, you'll find all the course material. The pre-recorded videos uh, will be available online and they will be available at least until after the second exam. I will also make PDF slides available both on the website and on Elias. Those PDF slides will be available a few days. As the pre-recorded format of yours doesn't give the students the opportunity to ask questions uh, live and during the sessions, uh, there will be a forum on Elias, which will serve as the primary means for discussions. In addition to the lecture, there will also be exercises. And other than the lecture, those exercises won't be pre-recorded, but they will be live. We'll have the exercises over Zoom. And as I'm currently still working on the format for the exercises, uh, more information on that will be published on Elias and on the website or during the course of the next few weeks. Um, what I can, can tell you so far is that our first exercise session will be on April 22nd and uh, this will actually be a, a special exercise and will again be a pre-recorded exercise. And uh, there I'll give a brief introduction into C++. C++ is going to be the primary language that we will use in the lecture and in the examples that are presented in the lecture. And uh, as C++ is not the predominant lecture that is taught at the University of Cologne in computer science, uh, there will be a brief introduction to uh, C++ uh, next week on April 22nd. And so that our first real exercise, our first live exercise will be on April 29th. And there we'll, we'll also discuss our first exercise sheet and the exercise sheets uh, will be uh, uploaded uh, one week in advance so that the students already have time to uh, look into the exercise and to, uh, to work on the exercises and then we will discuss them one week later. So the exercises will also be in English. And uh, more information on the actual proceedings uh, will be announced on Ilios and will be announced on the website. Similarly to the course material uh, for the lecture, uh, the exercise sheets will also be published on Elias and will also be published on the website.
And in addi addition to that, I will mention further literature throughout the course of the Let us finally have a look at the literature for this course. So first off, you will find the slides for this course to be very verbose and very wordy. And this was a deliberate choice because they will serve as the primary course material that you'll use to, uh, to learn and to work uh, towards the exams. And then uh, throughout the courses and throughout the sessions, I'll um, mention certain textbook chapters and certain papers that are relevant uh, to, to, to the various topics that we'll discuss. And I'll highlight those uh, during the sessions. And then um, apart from that, there are three textbooks that are relevant to this lecture in general. And uh, let me first say all of those are like like rather huge textbooks, so you aren't required to read or understand them in their entirety. Um, but nevertheless, they will they they can help you uh, help you uh, strengthen your understanding of the various topics. So the first textbook that is relevant to like the first five, six, seven sessions or so is that by Patterson and Hennessy on computer organization and design, and that textbook talks a lot about computer architecture. Um, also about performance, like the uh, first lectures on performance, the first sessions on performance are um, based off of that textbook and the respective text uh, chapters in the textbook. And um, yeah, then later when we come discuss computer graphics, um, there's a very fundamental textbook by Shirley and Marschner called Fundamentals of Computer Graphics, and that will give you a very basic introduction into uh, various computer graphic topics. And then later when we will discuss uh, ray tracing and physically based rendering, you might want to have a look at uh, Farr, Jacob and Humphreys physically based rendering from theory to implementation. This is actually a really huge textbook that goes into all the details of uh, writing a physically based rendering engine based on ray tracing from scratch. Uh, it's a very good book um, that is uh, also available online under the link that I provide here. Yeah, have a look at, at, at those textbooks. So I would suggest that we start right away with the first part of the lecture. And that first part of the lecture is called Performance of Computer Programs. Let's talk a bit about the objectives of this first part. And the first part will be comprised of four, maybe five individual individual sessions. And uh, we'll talk, we'll first talk about um, what performance actually is, like um, how to assess performance and how to measure it. And after that, um, we will also talk about uh, massively parallel architectures. So what we'll discuss is um, which historic developments uh, over the years led to architectures becoming more and more parallel and then eventually giving rise to developments such as multi and many core and uh, GPGPU architectures. And we will also learn that uh, concurrency and parallelism are like inherent to computer architecture. So uh, concurrency has been there since there are computers, there has been concurrency. And we will uh, learn on which level concurrency was and is actually exposed. And on top of that, we will also learn uh, which type of concurrencies can be programmed and which type of concurrencies can be influenced by the, by the programmer. And we'll learn how to do this. And then we'll also learn about theoretical aspects of parallel programming, where we will encounter certain instruments that help us make assessments about like, for example, complexity of algorithms and other theoretical measures that help us understand uh, how efficient a parallel algorithm actually is. In the first few sessions, we'll talk about uh, transistors and how they influence performance. So on the very first topic that we will discuss in this regard is Moore's Law. And uh, Moore's Law is a prediction that was made by Gordon Earl Moore in uh, 1965. And there's a common misconception about what that prediction actually was. And what is commonly referred to as Moore's Law is a doubling in performance every 18 to 24 months. The doubling in performance of computers, commonly saying. And um, that's not actually what Gordon Moore stated. But um, what Gordon Moore stated in his uh, 1965 study, his 1965 paper, is a doubling 
of uh, transistors on a microchip every, in 1965, he predicted a, a doubling every 12 months. And then he later in 75 corrected that to every every 24 months. Like, um, and there was a certain time, um, like in the 90s or in the 80s and 90s, um, where a doubling in transistors basically meant a doubling in clock frequency. And so this was commonly perceived as a doubling in performance. So the, the computer programs uh, running on these computers run twice as fast. While in reality, it's uh, really only the number of transistors that doubles every 24 months uh, on a computer ship. So this um, prediction was later formalized by the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, and then they reformulated this a, a bit um, in terms of the transistor density per uh, unit uh, ship area. And today we um, talk about uh, production processes, which can be like 22 nanometer, 10 nanometer, and so forth. And it is um, worth noting that the uh, initial Moore prediction um, referred to only 35 transistors being deployed to a single, step, single, single ship. And it is um, extraordinary that uh, this prediction uh, still roughly holds even today, where we talk about billions of transistors that are integrated in a, in a, in a microchip. So here's a So let's have a look at this, uh, at this chart here. And what this chart depicts is the um, structural size of Intel processors, so the production processes and their development from the 1980s until today. So there's a couple things that we can see here. On the one hand, we see that uh, the, um, the transistor density and the, um, the structural size of the processors in the 80s was um, like around uh, 1500 nanometers. And nowadays we are at um, 14 nanometers for Intel processors and for uh, other processor types we're actually at uh, even lower structural sizes. So um, nowadays in the two tw 2020s, we're at like, um, like a couple hundred of millions um, of transistors per square meter of ship area. So, and another thing that is important to note here is the, um, is the logarithmic scale of this chart. Um, because a logarithmic scale is usually an indicator of a very high growth rate. So now that we know that it's not actually the performance that doubles every 18 or 24 months, but rather the number of transistors, the ultimate question becomes, um, what do we actually do with this extra number of transistors? Like what we ultimately want to achieve is um, an improvement in performance, whatever that is, and um, what we uh, have, what do we have available is uh, more transistors. And the question now becomes, um, what do we do with those? And one type of measure that we can take is adding more um, logic to our CPU. And our logic, that would mean we add extra ALUs, uh, arithmetic logical units. Or we could um, add extra special purpose registers that we can uh, perform a certain logic, certain vectorized logic on, on like ZIMD registers that we will, uh, that we will uh, discuss uh, throughout the course of this, of this lecture. So apart from extra logical um, gates, what we can, gates or, uh, or, or units or whatsoever, what we also can add is um, extra memory elements. So and on a very technical level, like on, a, on the lowest level, this boils down to extra adding extra flip-flop elements. Like, and those uh, flip-flop elements on a more on higher levels, uh, uh, they can be used to build um, to build, yeah, for example, register register files or or caches. So we can add logic, we can add memory elements, <clears throat> and we can also add extra circuitry like the fabric fabric that, that, that connects those, those uh, elements that we discussed before. 
And then there are also certain like, infrastructural elements that, yeah, that are uh, usually necessary. Like for example, if we have an ALU, that usually also implies that there are are elements like multiplexers, like matrix switches, etc., that perform like infrastructural tasks. So, and as our ultimate goal is to increase performance using those means that I that I uh, introduced before, um, we should first understand what performance really is. And for that, let us consider an example. Um, let's consider an example from aviation. Like, and in, um, in that example, we'll uh, consider the Concorde passenger plane, which was like the fastest plane imaginable with uh, over 1,300 miles per hour, and um, the problem with this plane was that it would only accommodate 12 passengers. And let us also consider the Boeing 747, which has a speed above ground of roughly 470 miles per hour, um, but that at the same time can accommodate 450 passengers instead of only 12. So, so one would be inclined to say performance is really just speed. And this example uh, definitely shows us it's not just about speed. Like, um, like when it's only about speed, we have a clear winner, which is the Concorde. Like this is pretty clear. Um, on the other hand, if we define um, performance as throughput, that is, for example, how many passengers can we um, accommodate, and accommodate and, uh, and, 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 and and carry per hour, then we have a clear winner, which is the 747, right? So, and while this is, of course, a, an illustrative, but also a very simplified example, it's in fact quite similar with computers. So, for example, like one, one might just define that a computer X performs better than a computer Y if uh, that computer can run a program P uh, faster than Y. And then there's also the data center view, which um, basically states um, that a computer performs better um, if it can retire more jobs than another computer, like say within an hour or within a day. So, which is the throughput put argument from before. Um, and then there's maybe a user centric view, like um, the computer is faster that minimizes the latency, like the time. Uh, that it takes to execute a certain task. Like for example, the computer is faster uh, because it uh, booted in one minute and not in two. Or it took me 30 seconds to save the file and the old computer uh, took over a minute so the computer is faster. Right? So in those examples they show that, um, that uh, performance on the one hand is the performance of a computer but on the other hand, a performance is also the performance of a computer program performing a certain task, right? And um, this brings us to our first definition, the definition of a computer program. And the computer program is the entirety of its instructions, I, and of the data, D, that the computer program operates on. So, and let us now try to come to a formal definition of what performance actually is. Um, one thing that I can tease uh, very early on, performance is not complexity, like it is uh, not big O uh, notation and asymptotics like you maybe have discussed in computer science one. And um, we'll, we'll instead make the assumption that the algorithms that the computer program is comprised of are, um, are like reasonable. Uh, this would mean that you uh, have chosen the right algorithms or the right set of algorithms that your program is comprised of, um, according to both uh, to both to yeah, according to the input and uh, specifically according to the data. Uh, meaning, for example, that we that we so we have made an made an educated choice. Like, for example, if we know that uh, typically an input is large, we will have made a decision. That, uh, that is beneficial with regards to, co to complexity, like we we'll have chosen a uh, n log n algorithm over an n squared algorithm. And um, so we have made a decision based um, not merely on theory, but based on like specific input size, for example. So this might, for instance, also imply that we uh, prefer, in certain cases, 
algorithms will first runtime complexity only because of certain knowledge of the input data and the input size. Like a typical example being um, like quicksort being for large n being the optimal algorithm uh, for uh, sorting data items, but um, for uh, smaller n, like maybe 400 or 50 n, we might prefer a simpler algorithm, um, which might actually perform better on our certain on a certain architecture, um, based on certain effects like on cache effects, etc. And um, we might have made an informed decision uh, to prefer this algorithm over the one with the better uh, asymptotic behavior, uh, only because of certain knowledge of the input data. So we will later also discuss complexity, um, but uh, for now we will call, we'll, um, assume that complexity is a theoretical construct and uh, the definition of performance that we are after is uh, more of a practical definition than a theoretical, theoretical concept. So in, in order to to actually measure the performance of a computer program, um, what we do is we measure the absolute time that it takes a computer program to execute um, all its instructions, but with respect to a specific input huh, and on a specific processor. You will note that this can become difficult um, when we take uh, parallel processing into account where multiple processors um, work on the same program at once. And uh, the, the, the quantity that we are after here is really wall clock time, like the CPU execution time. Like um, regardless of how many tasks operate in parallel, what we, are, uh, what we define as performance is, uh, is really um, how long does, it, long does it take in uh, units of time for the program to be executed on a certain computer. So uh, this is our definition of, ex of CPU execution time. The CPU execution time or the wall clock time is the time it takes a program to execute all its input data dependent instructions on a certain processor. So this notion of CPU execution time has a bunch of implications. Like for instance, when we are on a parallel processor, say on a multi-core processor, and um, we have a program that can run in parallel, we don't add up the individual time that it takes for each core to execute the program, but we really consider the wall clock time. That is, um, when a program starts, we take a look at the clock at the wall as it's hanging on the wall, and uh, when a program stops, we again look at the clock, and then we take the difference of the two times at the stop time of the, of the stop time and of the starting time. There is, however, another implication that is uh, maybe not so obvious, and that implication is as we're measuring CPU execution time, that means we're potentially also measuring other instructions that are not directly related to the program execution, like. Um, like, like for instance, um, like for instance, the operating system performing some type of maintenance task in the background or something, and eating up resources that would otherwise be spent on the program execution. But also, again, consider we have a parallel program, and the parallel program uh, has uh, multiple processes working, uh, working, working in conjunction on the same problem. And then, for for almost every parallel program, there's uh, some amount of communication that is necessary, which results in overhead. And uh, that overhead we also measure, or maybe overhead for uh, for the program to communicate with the operating system in order to uh, load files and to uh, check permissions first. So we are potentially um, measuring all sorts of instructions that are uh, unrelated or that are only remotely related to the program execution. And based on those assumptions, we can now finally define the CPU execution time as a measure of performance. The CPU execution time is the number of clock cycles times the time per clock cycle. And the number of clock cycles depends on the instructions i of a certain computer program when it operates on data d. And due to the identity that the uh, time per clock cycle is the same as 1 over the clock frequency, we equivalently um, obtain the uh, equation 2 on this slide where it says that the CPU time is the number of clock cycles 
depending on I and D, over the clock frequency. So there's another important identity that, re that is required to compute the CPU execution time, which is the identity that the number of clock cycles of I and D is equivalent to the number of instructions that the program performs times the CPI. What is CPI? CPI stands for clock cycles per instructions, and it's, uh, it denotes the average instruction time of the computer program with respect to its input. So that means in order to understand the performance of a computer program, we first have to uh, determine this quantity, the uh, CPI, so that we can compute uh, this measure of performance. And uh, let us first understand uh, what CPI really is and how to obtain it from a computer program. And for that, we will um, we will uh, consider this uh, this very tiny ANSI C program that'll actually recur throughout the lecture. So for that reason, I will go over it in some detail. The Zaxby um, uh, function is a is a typical HPC uh, function. So when you're when you're checking HPC classes or reading an HPC book, um, chances are that you will. Uh, that you'll encounter this example, and Zaxby operates on a on on a bunch of vectors, and um, it uh, takes the vector x and the vector y, and both those vectors are of length n, and then it performs uh, this operation, that is a multiplication and a and an, a vectorial addition, and stores the result in this vector s here. So an important observation in this uh, very, very, very tiny example here is um, that each loop iteration is independent of all the other loop iterations. Yeah, like um, every execution of the loop body um, has exactly one i, and there are no uh, interdependencies um, from one from one loop iteration to to the previous one, for example, or to one of the previous ones. So um, this example will recur. Uh, variations of this example will, um, will recur throughout the lecture and um, there will be a bunch of bunch of different variations of that that we will see like for example what we'll what we'll see oftentimes is that the result of the computation for example is directly stored in one of the input variables so that we don't have an extra variable for output etc and um, we will uh, use this uh, very tiny ANSI C program to uh, yeah, in, in the following, we will use it to identify and uh, analyze the CPI. So in order to understand what, uh, what a CPI is, I um, took this very tiny program and um, ran it through this tool, through the Compiler Explorer tool that can be found under, under godbolt.org. Uh, let me actually show you this tool real quick. Like the Compiler Explorer tool is comprised of a couple of different windows, where the most important ones are the Code Editor window that you uh, see here configured to the left-hand side. And um, I can interactively uh, type code in this uh, Code Editor window. And you can see as I'm typing, the uh, tool recompiles the, uh, the code. And uh, as you can see here, now I introduced a compiler error, a syntax error. Let me fix that again, and you can also see um, that I configure can configure like uh, different flags and different build configurations. Like now, I turned off optimization, and as you can see, I get a bunch of like I get a couple more instructions than I do when I compile with a heavy optimization. And you can also see that I can obtain uh, tooltips and context-sensitive help uh, for uh, those instructions, which is, which is actually pretty helpful. As you can see, uh, you can uh, can configure the tool in different ways and uh, use different compilers, compile for different architectures. So it's actually a pretty helpful tool, and uh, you want to play play a bit with it, and maybe it's even helpful like for the exercises. So. And I configured this tool to uh, output x86 assembly, huh? and I compiled it with optimization. As you can see here, so I passed a flag that uh, the program's going to, going to be optimized. 
Um, I compiled it with the GCC compiler and I compiled it for a 64-bit architecture. So in the output of uh, this code, of this, the uh, output of this uh, compiler run uh, was this here. So, and um, uh, the output, I took the output and annotated, with, annotated with it with a bunch of comments so, so that we see what, what, is, what is going on here. So what is happening here? The first instruction is the uh, move instruction and we see here those are scalar instruction. The uh, SS here signifies that we're dealing with a single precision uh, scalar values as opposed to like for example, vectors that we will discuss later. The next instruction that we'll see is the is the is the multiplication. We then see the addition, yeah. and then we see how the result is uh, is uh, is uh, written back to the to, to the input variable y. Yeah. So and then you can see the very first very slight modification of this example and. Um, uh, and uh, different than before, I, do, I now don't pass this variable n, the, the length of the vector, but instead I configured a, a, a constant vector size, a vector size of 2. Yeah? And um, as we can see, the uh, compiler noticed that there is a vector length of, length of 2, and uh, for some reasons, um, whatever those reasons may be, the compiler decided to unroll this loop. So we have um, this pack of instructions here, and then there is this uh, second pack of instructions down here, which corresponds to the second loop iteration. And uh, this is uh, what I mean uh, when I say that the compiler was able to unroll the loop. And uh, you can also see that the compiler was able to optimize a little bit as uh, some of the contents is specifically this uh, scalar variable a uh, was already uh, loaded into loaded into uh, registers and therefore can spare one of the move instructions so and uh, from that we had a very easy means to analyze um, what the instructions of the particular program and of the particular program run if we were to run it um, actually were like and uh, that's this can, can, can obviously also actually relates to CPI. Huh? So we would then uh, like have a look into the manual of our compiler and of the CPU that we are targeting, and we will might maybe um, look up um, like uh, like this is a, this is very 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 much simplified, um, but we might for instance look up that a uh, that a memory access instruction like the move instructions has a latency of 100 clock cycles that it, it takes the instruction 100 clock cycles takes the CPU 100 clock cycles um, to retire the instruction so to execute the instruction and then we'll maybe find out that we we'll have uh, that we have uh, five clock cycles uh, per arithmetic, arithmetic operation and um, therefore we might find out that the um, that the uh, overall number uh, like 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 if my math is right here, hopefully um, we will find out that the uh, that uh, the number of clock cycles for all these operations is uh, six times one hundred for six memory accesses, and uh, four times five uh, for five arithmetic operations. We have uh, seven instructions overall, overall, and um, therefore we just divide by seven, and uh, that would give us the the yeah. The clocks per instruction for this program. Like we compute for each instruction, what is the latency, huh? and then um, we build the sum over all those latencies, and then we compute an average. And this is basically CPI. So in reality, like uh, latencies will will probably differ. Like for example, um, for a memory uh, access instruction, it's in, in in the presence of caches, it's pretty hard to say. Um, how many clock cycles the instructions will take, but uh, this is basically it. Now, in reality, things are, however, totally different. Like in reality, we 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 usually don't have uh, this fixed length of two, but we'll have a length of n. So, in in even in the simple case, the compiler can already no longer unroll the loop. 
So, um, and as I said before, CPI is, uh, is, is data dependent, depends on the input data. Uh, and, um, and, and if we were to compile uh, this, this uh, no, not to, if we were not to compile this function um, with the compiler explorer, we would see a com completely different uh, output of instructions. Yeah? You, you might actually uh, actually want to try this with the compiler explorer and a simple example to see what the output of this is. Yeah? And even in this simple example, it is um, much harder to compute CPI because we just cannot tell in advance uh, how many times the loop is executed and because this depends on the, the, on the input data. So, and as I said before, um, like like we just assumed that we can we can just look up the memory access latency of a of a of an instruction like the like the move instruction and um, assume that it's that it is like uh, one hundred clock cycles, but in the presence of of a cache hierarchy, this is uh, just not possible, and the latencies will actually differ a lot. Yeah, and because in general. Um, we cannot just analyze CPI in the way that we did with the very simple example from before with the fixed size loop. Um, what we usually do in order to determine CPI is we use profilers. And those profilers, they incorporate a technique that is called sampling. Sampling is something that's usually supported by the processor. What uh, basically happens there is we um, execute our program um, Inside that uh, that program that is called a profiler, and the profiler will from time to time just stop execution and count all the instructions that are currently in the pipeline. Like um, it, the processor has certain means to do this in a very lightweight mean uh, in a very lightweight way, so that it doesn't uh, doesn't disrupt program execution so much. Um, but the gist of this being that the the profiler can do this. Um, do this by gathering statistics about the instructions that are actually running. You know? Like in uh, reality, we can usually not just uh, compile our program into some machine language and then count instructions, but we, what we really have to do is um, we execute our program in the profiler and um, feed data into the program so that um, certain, uh, certain routines are called like um, which routines are called is data dependent. Uh, we don't know that in advance. And then uh, finally, after a program run, uh, we analyze the, the profiler output, and uh, the profiler will tell us. It will usually tell us uh, those uh, those those statistics. Like for example, what will, will tell us? It will usually tell us what CPI was for the program. Yeah. So and now that now we have discussed, we have we we have our. Um, definition of performance in terms of CPU execution time. And um, we know that it depends on like um, clock cycles and um, uh, the number of clock cycles. And we also know that the number of clock cycles depends on CPI. And now we have an idea of what CPI is. And we have an idea how to obtain CPI for a certain program run. And um, now, we also have an idea that uh, CPI is uh, very much data dependent. And um, so the, the last thing that we haven't uh, analyzed yet is um, like, like, uh, like um, all those quantities that we're, we've been discussing before depend on instructions. So, and that, that is, we never, never actually uh, discussed what an instruction really is. Like we saw in the compiler explorer tool, we saw a bunch of instructions and what they do and um, we discussed instruction latency and we discussed uh, clock cycles um, but we never really discussed what an instruction actually is. For our discussion what a instruction really is, um, let us first postulate that um, there are on the one hand that are there are assembly instructions and on the other hand there are machine instructions. And what we saw earlier in the uh, in the Gottwald and the Compiler Explorer example are were assembler instructions from a very specific instruction set from the x86 uh, instruction set, and um, those instructions map relatively map, map kind of directly to um, to machine instructions. Like um, assembler instructions are a bit more abstract uh, as there are. Like, 
it's for example so-called pseudo instructions like instructions that um, that are actually collections of a bunch of uh, more complicated instructions but um, nevertheless there's a relatively direct mapping from assembler instructions to machine instructions so and machine instructions uh, are expressed as a bit pattern and that bit pattern actually usually uh, corresponds to the word length of the CPU. Like for example, if you have a 32-bit CPU, you usually have um, 32 bits per instruction. Or if you have a 64-bit CPU, you have 64-bit instructions. And an instruction is usually comprised of something which is called an opcode. And the opcode um, is um, the mnemonics that we saw earlier, like the add, more, or move, for example. Um, those, those abbreviations, they directly correspond to opcodes that describe the functionality of the instruction, like what the, what the function does. So, and um, quite often, like um, for, for typical 32-bit instruction sets, um, there are like five bits that are uh, reserved, that are devoted to the opcode. And the uh, remaining bits um, encode other stuff, like for example, um, like, 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 um, like registers, or uh, like indirect memory accesses, etc. So for our discussion in the following, we will consider a, um, a, a particular instruction set, which is called MIPS. And earlier, when I showed you the Compiler Explorer tool, um, we encountered a, a different instruction set. And uh, this was the x86-64 instruction set, which is actually very common nowadays because it's implemented by, for instance, for instance by uh, Intel processors. And um, for our, our discussion now, we'll use MIPS because it's just a, a, a much simpler instruction set. Like certain things that I show you um, fundamentally, they also apply to x86, but x86 has certain specifics where, where certain things are a bit different and things are just easier to explain using MIPS. So and for our discussion, let's consider this uh, very simple statement and see where we have this, uh, this uh, integer addition and uh, then assignment to an output variable. And uh, if we were to compile this with MIPS, for example, with the Compiler Explorer and choosing MIPS as a target, um, that would uh, result in the following assembly. Uh, and um, the assembly basically says, perform the uh, operation called, called add, uh, the instruction called add, and uh, take the, uh, the, the uh, input from the two source registers, S1 and S2, and write the result to the output register T0. Yeah. So, and um, all that information um, would be encoded in a single instruction. Yeah. Like we have uh, here the instruction and uh, this bit field and uh, this whole bit field corresponds to this whole operation, like um, to the to the opcode that we're going up that we're gonna um, gonna execute, and to the uh, source registers and to the to the target the target register. So in detail, um, we have uh, this field number one, which encodes the opcode, and uh, all zeros stands for addition. Then uh, we also have field number six, and field number six basically uh, tells us if this is an immediate an immediate addition where you uh, have. Uh, have a have register content uh, plus a constant, or if it is a register and register addition. And then uh, we have field number two, which uh, encodes uh, the first source operand, that is uh, the source register one. And field number three uh, encodes um, which one is the uh, second source register, yeah, the, uh, the, the input source register, in our case, uh, register S2. Um, and uh, field number four um, encodes the target register and uh, field number five uh, happens to be not have, happens to not be used by, by our instruction. Yeah. So uh, in general means we have field number one encodes the upper the opcode and uh, field number two encodes the first source operand, field number three encodes the second source operand. Um, field number three encodes the destination operand. Um, field number five encodes something that is called the shift amount, which is, for example, relevant for, uh, yeah, for shift operations, and it's basically a special code. Huh? And um, field number six um, can specify a, a, a certain variant of the, of the opcode, uh, like we discussed before. Huh? 
So um, in general, this means that uh, all of the information that is required to retire an information that is to um, to successfully execute the, uh, the 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 instruction, all the information is encoded in those uh, in those word length. So in this case, thirty two bits. So and uh, the compiler takes our uh, high level program, like our C program, and translates this into uh, machine uh, into machine code. Huh? And um, then later, when we execute the program, the CPU is uh, presented with those with those bit fields, yeah? like and uh, the CPU will uh, take the instructions and uh, when it retires them, it will first of all decode the opcode in order to understand what it actually has to do, and then it will load uh, register contents, um, compute the results based on the instruction that is encoded in the opcode store the result into the uh, destination register, registers, um, etc. Yeah. And with that, we can put it all together, as now we have all the basic ingredients uh, for our uh, definition of performance, which is proportional to the CPU execution time, to the wall clock time. And um, the wall clock time is the product of the number of instructions times um, the average clocks per instruction times the time that it takes that that uh, it takes to perform a single single clock cycle and um, both the number of instructions as well as cpi are determined empirically using a profiler that um, performs sampling based on a particular program run that is uh, based on the uh, program's instructions and based on the data that is the input to the program and uh, single instructions uh, are derived uh, from their machine language equivalents and are expressed as short bit fields that contain all the relevant information. And the question now remains, um, what ways do we have available to increase performance? Because this is our, uh, our ultimate goal, you know, to, to increase performance. And the means that we have uh, available in order to increase performance is um, so on the one hand, if we have a certain program, um, what we can do is we can just try to use, um, on average, instructions that are faster. Like, for example, if we see we have a lot of instructions that perform memory accesses, and we know that the latency from memory accesses is, uh, is, uh, is, is way higher than the latency from, say, arithmetic instructions, then we can try to optimize our program in a way that we use more arithmetic instructions than uh, than than uh, memory, than, 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 than memory access instructions. Yeah? Now we can um, usually try to use algorithms um, that um, just use fewer instructions. Like if we know that we have one algorithm that is um, um, O of n squared and the other algorithm is O of n log n, we uh, might decide to use the O of n log n uh, algorithm just in order to um, reduce the number of, of, of instructions that are retired. And um, also the choice, the choice in programming language has an influence on how many uh, instructions are emitted by the compiler or by, by the interpreter. Huh? So, and another means uh, that we can make use of is that we just increase the clock frequency, clock frequency of the processor, yeah? Is use a processor with a higher clock frequency. So that's our, essentially um, the means we have at hand to improve the performance. Let us put this on more formal grounds. For that, we will have a look at the table here on this and on the following slide. So here I depict several factors that influence performance, and we will see um, which part of performance and of, of CPU execution time the factors influence, and we'll also see how they do this. So, and um, one factor that obviously has an influence on performance is the choice of algorithm and the choice of algorithm in influences both instruction count and CPI. As, I mean, obviously, the uh, choice of algorithm determines um, which type of instru instructions are used. And for example, if we have, um, if we have um, algorithms that are, are, are quite heavy on arithmetic and logic instructions, um, this might have uh, different CPI and also instruction counts than algorithms that are heavy on memory accesses.
So the choice of programming language has a strong influence on instruction count and on CPI. Um, and um, there's usually a tendency that um, the more high level the language is that we choose, um, the more instructions are usually output by the compiler or by the interpreter. Yeah? So, and then uh, the choice of compiler actually, and the way that we use the compiler influences instruction count and CPI, huh? because the um, compiler um, optimizes for different objectives, like uh, depending on how we configure our compiler, it might optimize for binary size or uh, for, yeah, for, for optimal instructions, um, but also for things like, for example, for compile times, so, which is also an important objective in certain uh, in certain uh, in, in certain projects where you have uh, many lines of, lines of code and many files to compile, and then there's the choice of instruction set architecture. Like if we use x86, if we use MIPS, or if we use ARM, and um, this is actually the um, only um, yeah the only the the only real um, factor that has an influence uh, apart from an influence on instruction count and on CPI. It has an influence on clock frequency, yeah? because simply speaking, an architecture that implements lots of uh, special purpose instructions like square roots or inverse square roots or trigonometric functions generally has to be more complex and has to supply um, more infrastructure and more logic to, uh, to differentiate between the different instructions and uh, that adds to the overall complexity of the of the of the architecture, and that again means that we can generally achieve lower clock rates with uh, complex instruction sets. So this is probably a good point to stop for today, um, as we learned quite a lot today. We learned um, what performance is. Um, we learned a lot about instructions and about uh, CPIs, and um, we also learned uh, how to influence this as a as a programmer and also as a as a as a hardware developer potentially, and tomorrow we will learn a bit about power consumption, and we will also learn how power consumption essentially influenced um, the whole development of CPU architectures over the last ten to fifteen years.